All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming back. For those of you who may not have been here this morning, um, um, we took the time this morning to hear from the CAB and staff uh, on the Bureau's recent payday proposal. This afternoon, we're going to resume our CAB meeting uh, with a discussion on trends and themes that our CAB members are experiencing and observing in their communities. At every CAB meeting, we invite a few members to share their information um, and their expertise with us. To date, uh, we have had CAB members present on a variety of issues, just such as consumer protection and service members, um, older Americans, arbitration, uh, pre-acquired account marketing, and other issues. Today, we asked three CAB members, Gene Spencer, Julie Guggen, and Ann Badur, to present on um, issues facing low and moderate income consumers in the mortgage market, on payday lending and auto title lending issues. And so we'll begin with Jean and Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Director Cordray, fellow CAB members, CFPB staff, and our guests in the audience. We appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today and have a conversation, at least Julie and I. We'll be talking about the uh, challenges that uh, lower income consumers are having in the mortgage market. I can move the slides along here. That's not it. Let me go back. Try the other one. Try the other one here. Technology break. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So um, we thought it might be good to frame the conversation by just sort of starting with the, the larger um, national view. And, uh, but this is playing out in different levels uh, in, across the nation. Some communities uh, have recovered from the housing crisis quite nice, nicely, but many others are still struggling. But in general, housing consumers are navigating a very difficult uh, pathway towards uh, a new mortgage environment. And the challenges that uh, housing consumers um, are facing are still pretty large. So this slide just sort of summarizes uh, where we are at this point in the game. Uh, there's still three to four million people who are seriously delinquent or in danger of foreclosure. There are about seven million or so who have lost their homes and are in uh, our opinion are in some state of recovery from having lost their homes. This information comes from uh, the Hope Now uh, Alliance data. Um, according to information from the Urban Institute, and I, Give a nod to my colleagues, Don and Ellen, because uh, actually I'll actually be citing quite a bit of uh, data from, from their shop. Uh, that according to an analysis, roughly uh, 1.2 million borrowers are being, uh, potential home buyers are being sidelined because of the credit conditions that exist in the marketplace. And this compares with uh, uh, a market environment looking all the way back to roughly 2000, year 2000, which was in many ways, um, much healthier uh, market than we've seen since that time. And uh, overall, what we're seeing, and which is a disturbing trend, is playing out uh, in the impact of the market on lower income borrowers, is the fact that many uh, minority home buyers are not being able to participate in the housing market at this, this point. And that is, um, you know, the unfortunate economic fact is that uh, many, uh, lower um, minorities are in the lower income uh, segment of the population. So, and since Julie and I both operate in the housing education, counseling, and coaching arena, we do think that our, the work that our um, agencies do has potential for uh, helping to deal with some of the consumer challenges that they are facing. So, thanks, Julie. So a couple of uh, headline uh, points of view here, uh, and that's, Basically, the fact that we do think that the, um, the issues that borrowers are facing have heavily been driven uh, by the housing crisis and its lingering after effects. We've seen the uh, homeownership, the national homeownership rate uh, fall from a high of 69% in 2005 to less than 64% at the end of 2000, uh, today. I think the last numbers I recall seeing are that it's around 63%. Um, 
most critically, for minorities, um, it's much lower than the white home ownership rate. So Africa, the African American rate is about 42 percent. The Hispanic rate is just um, a little bit higher at 44 and a half percent. And it's very interesting. You look back at uh, the lead up to the crisis, and less than about a quarter of blacks had prime credit scores versus roughly 65 percent of whites back in 2003. And uh, blacks, as well as Hispanics, um, represented a huge untapped market for subprime lending. And this ultimately played out in uh, the aftermath of the crisis and a tremendous loss of wealth for African American and Hispanic home owners. According to reports by Pew and the Brandeis University, both showed that about a half of the wealth of blacks was stripped by the Great Recession. And, um, if you look back even further, uh, the, note the importance of home ownership to wealth creation. Roughly 27% um, of the wealth gap between uh, African Americans and whites was attributable to home ownership. That's a, if you were a homeowner between the uh, years of 1984 and 2009. So it had contributed significantly to uh, wealth creation and in fact, with the Great Recession, it uh, created significantly to uh, wealth destruction. So what we're dealing with now are many borrowers with damaged credit profiles and uh, with credit scores uh, that have uh, declined significantly as a result of the crisis, and then also dealing with larger economic factors such as weak job and income growth, which is uh, creating a big struggle for more marginal uh, consumers. So in Minnesota, this, uh, this phenomenon has been particularly confounding. Uh, we have historically had the highest rate of home ownership in the country among uh, non-Hispanic white households and the lowest rate of home ownership among minority households. And uh, at the Minnesota Home Ownership Center, we, t we took a look at that in, within the last couple of years. And, noted several factors that uh, we in the homeownership counseling industry as well as our lending and real estate partners are trying to get a trying to get a grasp on right now some of the factors that we found that really contribute to this are certainly um, income and asset disparities among whites and households of color in our state uh, we tend to in in income uh, in job creation, in education, we tend to experience some of the greatest disparities um, that, uh, that, that are seen in, in all of those categories around the country. And then certainly uh, many minority households in Minnesota lack generational modeling, so they have not grown up in home ownership, and uh, therefore the reality of home ownership or that sort of innate uh, uh, or that learned home ownership is not, is not mo modeled in their households. Clearly, there's a lack of trust in the home buying systems. Um, African American uh, households in Minnesota were particularly and disproportionately impacted by the foreclosure crisis and have been left behind in the recovery, as, as Jean indicated. So there is a deep uh, lack of trust in um, our homeownership institutions. There's also, related to the generational modeling, is the lack of cultural awareness of the system. We have a high immigrant population in Minnesota, and uh, there are many factors that um, make uh, the, the ability of home ownership not even on the radar screen of households of color. And then certainly we can't ignore the idea that there um, are likely fair lending and fair housing issues that contribute to, um, contribute to this phenomenon. We've created a task force in Minnesota consisting of uh, government, real estate, lending, and uh, nonprofit leaders that are trying to look at this issue and uh, have now reached the point where we're talking about systems and how does the general home ownership system, whether it's how real estate and uh, lending professionals are compensated, all the way up to uh, whether um, the real estate and loan professionals represent communities of color and how we can address those pervasive systems issues. Yeah, at the Homeownership Preservation Foundation, uh, where I work, um, we are the national consumer support uh, uh, portal for the Treasury's Make the Home Affordable program. So the focus of our work over the last uh, eight years has been primarily 
on those borrowers who are facing foreclosure. And the first to try to help them, those that we can help to find some kind of alternative to foreclosure, primarily a modification, if not a refi, or in some cases a short sale. But also for those who have um, succeeded in gaining a modification to help them be successful. Uh, one of the most uh, important programs that we've implemented with the uh, support endorsement of Treasury is uh, the uh, requirement for post-modification housing counseling and where in, um, uh, individuals who have gotten a modification are encouraged, invited to work with a housing counselor to make sure that they are able to um, uh, make the lifestyle changes to give them the best chance of success with that modification. And uh, the performance of the borrowers who come through that system has been quite uh, uh, compelling, uh, roughly 25%, uh, indicating a roughly 25% improvement in their um, re redefault rates. So those who've gone through the counseling uh, redefault on those modified loans are 25% um, less um, than uh, those who have not gone through the counseling. So there's a focus there, but both Julie and my organization are now uh, focused on trying to help people who are dealing with the current challenges marketplace to uh, to gain access to credit in the best way uh, possible. So the current market that new potential home buyers are facing uh, is very very tight. I mean, uh, the this chart which I borrowed from friends at CoreLogic sort of indicates the level of. Um, of tightness uh, of credit in the marketplace. As you can see from the peak there, and um, the credit standards were loosest, as you might expect, in the lead up to the housing crisis. And since that time, they have uh, tightened considerably, even below um, the year 2000, which is what this chart is indexed to. The next <laughs> chart, thanks. Uh, is another look at the current market, and it just shows the state of uh, affordability or unaffordability uh, based on, uh, again, uh, information from CoreLogic. And it, uh, this chart indicates the home price to rent ratio, and it shows above the line means less affordable, below the line means more affordable. And as you can see, given uh, this, is this is national level data, but given uh, the changes in the marketplace, primarily uh, attributable to really tight supply of homes available for sale um, right now, not only are credit standards tight, but housing in generally is being characterized as uh, unaffordable based on their analysis. It it's one of the most, um, it, it, it's one of the factors that our housing advisors cite most frequently in terms of difficulty in consumers uh, in, in this post-recovery environment achieving home ownership and its lack of supply. So uh, the real estate market is still confounding and uh, rents are increasing as a result. So um, we're watching that very, very closely. Housing affordability is not improving. So it's, uh, it's especially for folks in the lowest income brackets. So this is our last slide, but it just summarizes some of the issues and I'll invite uh, fellow CAB members to uh, provide their own color on these. But the key challenges uh, still relate to um, income primarily. Uh, recovery is uh, taking a very long time to, uh, to ameliorate. And so uh, there are many wage growth has been slow to pick up. And so uh, we have uh, in general lower, you know, lower incomes and uh, smaller savings and lower credit sc scores for many people who lost their jobs on, and had other uh, hits uh, as a result of the Great uh, Depression, uh, Great Recession. But um, in addition, there's some factors in the marketplace that are playing out uh, that are making it harder for lower income individuals who typically would qualify for smaller loans to get access to those loans. Certainly, uh, Second point there is that there are certainly better lender economics for larger loans. It takes about the same amount of work to produce a $500,000 loan as to produce a $100,000 loan. And so clearly the larger loan could generate better uh, economics, particularly if it is oriented towards higher income individuals with higher credit scores. 
Um, and uh, if you were look back to year 2000, I think the average uh, credit score, uh, or what was deemed a prime score, was about uh, 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 700. Uh, in 2014, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Ellen, but I think it was closer to 750. Uh, so there's been some fundamental shifts in what now is being uh, deemed the prime score. So, uh, so it just contributes to the better economics for larger loans. And uh, these tighter credit standards uh, are being burdened by risk uh, overlays uh, out of concerns about buyback and litigation risk. These are lender concerns about those risks, about the higher servicing costs for delinquent loans. I think, again, the uh, information of the uh, reports from the Urban Institute indicate that servicing um, uh, delinquent loans about 15, 15 times higher than, than the cost of um, the cost of servicing a delinquent loan is about 15 times higher than the cost of servicing a performing loan, which again causes lenders to be that much more leery of um, making any kind of loan uh, that could potentially go bad. So that's a big issue. Um, there's also uh, lower income borrowers that have traditionally been serviced by FHA, VA, and rural credit loans, and many of those are also being burdened by some overlays due to potential litigation risks um, um, for making inappropriate loans. Or um, so anyway, so that that those are uh, key issues. And of course, discrimination is um, always a concern, uh, whether it's related to economics, related to location, or related to to race. So these are things that are affecting um, borrowers in this marketplace. And um, so I think you know, we, the challenges are great to try to facilitate access to credit for people who are deserving of credit, but most importantly, to help them be as successful as possible once they do uh, gain access to, um, to, to particularly a, a home. So I would um, go back to something Jean was talking about, the lender economics for larger loans. I would argue that it's much harder <laughs> to do a, a, a lower value loan than it is a higher value loan. Many of them, um, it, uh, if a lender, if a loan officer is working on a special loan product, um, the, t the paperwork tends to be pretty onerous and uh, the, the, the borrower usually also comes with down payment and closing cost programs that have their own requirements, and it's just harder to do those loans. It takes longer, and the, the compensation just doesn't work. So um, that's a particular challenge. Minnesota, we're also facing issues about uh, credit availability relating to people's race and culture. So uh, we long for more ITIN products. Uh, the biggest issue that's uh, facing the Minneapolis uh, minority borrowing community right now is uh, loan products that are sensitive to Islamic law. So uh, uh, those in the Muslim population um, who, who, um, are, who, who um, abide by their, um, the, the strictures of their religion cannot borrow with interest. So, uh, and there are very few loan products available that will accommodate those, uh, those borrowers and those uh, folks who are really in, otherwise in a position to be purchasing homes. So we're, we're concerned about that as well. So I would say, um, going back to um, sort of the post foreclosure crisis or some of, the, some of the programs that we worked on during the foreclosure crisis, if there's one good thing <laughs> that came out of the foreclosure crisis, it is that foreclosure counseling, to a certain degree, has become more normalized within the loss mitigation process. We um, have several partnerships with uh, lenders and Fannie Mae who recognize the importance of foreclosure counseling intervention and the importance of strong alliances between loss mitigation specialists and home ownership advisors, and that's proved to be particularly helpful for consumers. Those foreclosure clients that we're seeing now tend to be clients who um, participated in loss mitigation without the assistance of a home ownership advisor, and uh, wish we could have seen them three or four years ago when they were first in trouble. Julie and Jean, thank you very much. This is great information. Um, I would now open it up for questions and discussion by the CAB, um, your reactions to the information, and uh, particularly as it relates to the work of the Bureau. 
a little bit about uh, how student debt is playing into all of this and what you're seeing on the ground. And relatedly, um, what impact do you think having sort of the infrastructure around home buying uh, connected with also counseling around student debt, getting people into maybe income-based repayment plans where it frees up monthly cash and the ability to maybe um, get access to credit or be able to have the money for down payment? Our, our counselors see student loan debt impacting some of uh, the, um, the buyers that they're working with on the pre-purchase side of the equation, um, but it's not a majority of the consumers. So um, I think that's a factor of age, perhaps, and um, how long they've been in their home before we see them. But it's definitely a factor. Yeah, uh, our organization, again, primarily deals with existing home owners who are you know, in danger of foreclosure. And uh, we have, um, the, w the way the counselors work is they take a look at the entire financial picture of the borrower and uh, see what things can be uh, adjusted, what kind of lifestyle changes can be uh, you know, incorporated that would basically free up cash so that they can deal with other, other things. And uh, you know, student loans, um, I don't have, uh, statistics on overall how much debt, but we do see it. And then it's a challenge of, okay, so now what do, what do you do about it? And actually, interestingly, we have seen it, and I think this mirrors um, other uh, data from other sources. It, it, we've seen it in the profiles of older households. So it's where parents and yep. sometimes grandparents have actually you know, endorsed loans for their children, and so they're carrying, um, and in some cases, they, as part of, a result of the recession, uh, people went back to school to get additional credentials. So they're carrying higher levels of student debt um, for longer in the life cycle. So it's just another uh, challenge that the counselors uh, have to address for the consumer to try to basically get them the best uh, position to uh, take advantage of a modification or refi or whatever. But of course, you know, you know there are limited options as to what can be done with student debt, but uh, the counselors try to come up with the best. Yeah. Jean, I'm curious in your comments, you, you mentioned that you saw 2000 as a point in time where we had the right balance or there seemed to be a healthy balance in the marketplace and then how it sort of went out of sync on the and then and then came down crashing even lower can you talk about 2000 and what you think contributed to the right balance and what were the features that of the market that shifted between 2000 and 2008 you know and how we might be able to get back to 2000 if that's in fact <laughs> where we would like to be yeah, I, I think, um, well, as one who lived through that market, uh, you know, there was, um, th there was the early beginnings of what became the larger subprime market, but it was at a relatively small scale at that point in time. Um, also, it, I know uh, Larry Goodman, Ellen, and Urban have looked back at when the, the, uh, they came up with the missing um, numbers of home buyers, you know, it was largely based on that period of time, is that if you were to look back, you know, at that time, the um, market share for the more aggressive lending products was pretty low. Uh, the products such as option arms and, and others that ultimately wound up being sold to lower income borrowers, at that time were probably, you know, were primarily um, being focused on sort of higher income people who had greater risk tolerance and ability to deal with that. So um, those, those really uh, um, predatory type products and practices were at a much more limited level back in the year 2000. Um, the GSCs, Fannie Freddie, you know, had a much uh, more prominent role in the marketplace at that stage than they did in 2005. So by 2005, you had begun to see uh, a much larger private lending industry emerged and a reduction in the role of the traditional housing enterprises. And so you began to see products emerge in the early 2000s, but they really hit the market heavily in 2005, 2006, 2007. 
uh, that if you were to look back at where the primary losses in the mortgage market came from, it was from the products that were dominant in the marketplace in that period of time, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. And, uh, you know, those, and also um, housing prices, if you look back at the chart, we showed the level of unaffordability. Housing prices also uh, were considered in a bubble, you know, in hindsight, when a bubble during that period of time. So all of those, you know, if you look at, you know, what was in that time period versus what was earlier, and then certainly as we've come out of the crisis, you know, the uh, uh, credit has tightened to levels that we have not seen since, well, actually, at historical tights. Uh, it, it points to that, in hindsight, that being was representative of a pretty healthy market. So, maybe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, or a healthier market. You, Julie, you noted the, the lack of availability of, of supply, and, um, and I, I don't, I wonder at I mean, we have some factors going on now that are new. Uh, the withholding of REO from the market during yep. the crisis. Yep. Um, distressed asset sales by Fannie and Freddie. Bulk sales to investors as opposed yep. to availability of housing for individuals, uh, individual buyers. And then single family securization of property for rental, for the rental market. So I see a loss, and I look at big themes, loss of control over the local market loss of ability for people to access um, homes, big institutional players dominating local markets. Um, in this context, what kind of a role do you see that uh, uh, the CFPB perhaps could have in trying to alleviate what are some very large, you can't fix everything, yeah. uh, one agency, but in trying to address some of the big challenges here? Yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, the, the players in Minneapolis get absolutely apoplectic when they start talking, when they look at the number of bulk purchases that have been made and think about the point at which those are going to return to the market. Because property values are increasing. That's what the investors want, right? So at some point, they're going to flood the market again. And uh, Minneapolis is just, you know, up in arms about when that's going to happen and what impact that's going to have again on uh, consumers. So it's, it's interesting to watch. But um, I, I know I know less about the um, institutional investor than I probably should. But if there's, you know, that's that's the arena that's happening. It's, you know, the big the big players that may not even be from the U.S. and they might not be easily identifiable. But those are the folks who are buying up the inventory. So I guess I don't know how to answer that question, but I completely agree with you on um, the impact on the market. And they're buying up the inventory and renting? renting I'm sorry? Out? They're buying up the inventory and renting it out? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's happening a lot. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mayor. No, I understand most of the, most and most of the investments are structured as three to five year investments. So when we talk about the time period for dumping property, it is unclear that there will be any way of repaying investors at the end of the three to five years other than to to sell, which has huge implications for all of our markets, and I'd love for this agency to be, again, within its scope, out in front of this problem. And Well, yeah, if I can jump in with a response there. Yeah, I, I think that the, um, the market needs inventory, and that should, uh, you know, help <coughs> to make um, um, housing somewhat more affordable. Um, the market is also needed rentals. You know, so, uh, you know, institutional investors, and I used to work with this institutional investors, uh, you know, they saw an opportunity. They saw an opportunity and it came in in a very big way and snapped up properties at, you know, prices that they thought uh, were very reasonable in, particularly in relation to the amount of rent uh, income that could be generated. And sure, you know, eventually they will, um, I, ex well, I would expect at a certain point with at home price appreciation, then they will also begin to sell those properties back into the marketplace. So that's a likely scenario. Well, I think there's uh, just a piggyback on the on the inventory issue. Um, there's a lot of data that shows that credit is tighter um, and that there's much less lending taking place, especially in the entry level uh, tranches. 
Um, but it's hard to determine exactly why that is the case. Um, you look at those numbers, they tell you one story. When you talk specifically to lenders who are in those trenches, you do get a slightly different story. Um, and so those lenders will tell you that they have, there is product innovation happening in the marketplace today, and those products are not being consumed. And they're not being consumed because there are inventory issues in a lot of markets. I know there are exceptions, but in the, in the market in general. Uh, another thing, on top of what you may have said, uh, that's contributing to that is a number of underwater uh, mortgages that are out there today. And I just saw a report recently from Zillow that showed that uh, of the, and I believe there's something like 7 million homes still uh, with negative equity, uh, the overwhelming percentage of those homes are in the affordable range. So uh, like on a five to one ratio. So you can see how that is certainly exacerbating the, the, that inventory issue. Um, and then the, the, the inventory that does come in the market, there's tremendous competition from cash investors who are still out there um, aggressively in the marketplace, maybe not to the degree they were a year or two ago. So you have buyers that are out there who are qualifying for mortgages, maybe to your point need some down payment assistance. Those bids are just not being accepted. You know, the cash deal, even if it's for a little bit less money, is getting that bid more often than not. And so the lenders are saying, what do I gain by, by uh, expanding my credit um, um, uh, pool a little bit or innovating because I'm not getting any adopter, any, any, any market share with those products right now. So as the, as the supply and demand balance uh, improves, um, and I think some new construction and, and, of course, I think appreciation in prices will help with both of those things. We'll have a better sense of exactly what's happening in the credit market. It's just really tough to tell right now. Gary, does that Patty, happen? Oh, I'm sorry. To Patty, then Ellen, then Laura. Um, Julie, this is more for you. How much do you, uh, on the slide here, you have FHA, VA, and rural is really the credit sources for loans? Um, and I know in Philadelphia pre-crisis, there was a lot more activity around bank and CRA type loans. And while it's slowly coming back and I'm starting to see some activity in that area, they don't seem to have gotten back into the market as much. Um, so are you seeing much activity from the banks with CRA type products? Mortgages in particular. Yeah, so in, in, rural, in rural Minnesota, so outside the seven county Twin Cities metropolitan area, um, USDA RD product is still the product of choice for most low to moderate income buyers. So that's, that's, still, uh, that's still a popular choice. Uh, FHA is still pretty hot. But we also have a very robust state housing finance agency that has several bond programs with down payment and closing cost programs, and they, they remain very, very popular. So um, it's, it's mostly MHFA product that low to moderate income folks are using with some FHA. I know less about VA, unfortunately. Um, so first of all, for everybody who thinks that the CFPB has its fingers in all problems and can solve all <laughs> problems, um, this is a really good conversation because remarkably little of this is actually in the jurisdiction of the CFPB. Yeah. So those of you who think that, you know, this is the agency that, that uh, is the 10,000 pound gorilla. Uh, in this issue, it certainly is not. Um, uh, I guess I would say a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, our research definitely shows that um, for borrowers um, with high, de high debt to income ratios, borrowers with lower credit scores, and I'm not talking about bad credit scores, I'm talking right. about lower than 750, um, and, um, that, that, um, and lower down payments, the only, um, the only uh, uh, avenues are um, FHA, VA, and USDA, um, the GSEs just are not serving this population, and um, neither are the the banks. Um, so you know that is that's a, a serious problem that um, needs to come back somehow. And I don't think uh, from all with of all the problems that are driving the banks not to serve this population. CFPB rules are about at the bottom. 
Um, there are a lot more uh, things that are that are um, that are uh, restricting that access. I would say that um, our conversation yesterday about um, cred the Credit Invisibles report and about credit scores and the whole issue um, surrounding credit scoring is a place where the CFPB can help position people for the future, um, for being ready when, um, when the inventory does come back. Because um, in contrast to debt to income ratios and loan to value ratios, which are not all that far off where they were in 2001, it's the FICO scores, it's the, it's the credit scores that are out of whack. And to the extent that it is possible for the CFPB to um, encourage, to, to do the research to um, figure out um, whether there are um, better ways of scoring people that will um, enable um, some of the folks who are unscorable now or who have artificially low scores now or who have no score now to become scorable, um, it can put people in a position to be ready to buy when the inventory does come back. So that may be the one thing that the CFPB directly could um, do in this field. Ellen, when you say that banks aren't lending to these, um, I guess, lower credit score type borrowers, you mean on their balance sheet in particular? I mean, well, they're certainly not lending for the GSEs. And as far as we can tell, and as you know, it's very hard to um, tell exactly what the banks, particularly the small banks, are doing. As far as we can tell, they're not doing it on the balance sheet either. Now, the small banks may be doing it, and we're just not seeing it, but so far we're not seeing it. In my market, uh, particularly in Mississippi, you've seen an inc um, that prime lending to white borrowers has actually returned and, and exceeded the levels before the crisis. Uh, however, the uh, prime lending to uh, African Americans is still roughly 15% lower than it was before the recession. And so that's, I think, an indication of several things. I think it's not, it certainly reflects tighter underwriting, but it also, uh, these other factors that Jean and Julie highlighted are certainly come into play. Yeah, We're seeing the exact same denial issues in Minnesota, same right. thing. They just haven't recovered. And um, one of the more striking um, things on the Urban Institute um, website is um, the map that we did of um, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data from 2001 through 2000, uh, I guess 13 is the latest we've got, um, where each loan is um, mapped by race, and you can um, uh, hone in on cities. I have not looked at Omaha, but I certainly have looked at, at Detroit um, and at several other cities and you do see this phenomenon of lending disappearing entirely in about 2011, the white lending coming back, but the minority lending just staying away. Um, whole, whole, whole swaths of cities where there's no, no lending. There's also differential in lending in rural communities right. relative to uh, higher, more um, uh, prosperous uh, areas, and in areas where they're where banks have closed, banks have closed disproportionately in low-income communities and rural communities since the crisis, and uh, research has shown that in those communities where there's a bank branch, there's a more likelihood of being able to access an affordable mortgage, and the rate of subprime uh, high-cost mortgage lending is higher in those unbanked communities. Um, Laura. Um, that's fine. My question was answered. Thank you. Okay. Other? Just, could uh, I just, are, are you able to reverse the slides, go back to the one numbered number five, which had the, yeah, that one. So what I th thought is interesting and, you know, wasn't obvious this would be the case, although I think you've given a number of reasons why it turns out to be the case is, you know, it, I can follow what happened in the 2000s and then we had a bubble and a spike and then we had a crash. But since 2011, say, to 2015, it's just been flat at a very low level. Um, I, I think you've offered reasons now to help us understand why that's so, but, but 
one might well have expected that that would have started upwards by now. I mean, we're, we're in a, even though we've recovered in some respects economically, we're in a still very slow and, and grudging um, economic recovery with respect to the housing market in particular, which may just reinforce just how bad a crash we suffered exactly. in the housing market, which is where it was the worst of all. Okay. So we have a, um, at Urban, we have a something called the Housing Finance Policy Center Credit Accessibility Index, um, <laughs> which splits out risky borrowers and risky products. And what it shows is that bubble air, uh, uh, time was a time of, as Jean said, risky products. And what's happened is all the risky products are gone, but fewer, fewer borrowers uh, um, are, fewer borrowers with any risk character, the, the risk characteristics of the borrowers have also declined. So we're not at, a, at the same level of risk characteristics of the borrowers that we were in 2000, and that's why yeah. you've got the drop. And, and what's interesting is you gave a number of reasons that are quite convincing as to problems in the market that are holding it back. Lack of inventory, underwater inventory, investors coming in to buy in a depressed market. Some of them think that's a business opportunity, probably a right. Uh, all those things. But the other thing that's interesting that may be happening, certainly has happened a bit, whether it persists, is whether there's segments of the population that just no longer have an enthusiasm for home buying to the extent they once did because they now feel very, very keenly the amount of risk that's involved in that market that they did not appreciate before. Uh, and, and that, I, I wonder to what extent this is lack of demand because of, of psychological shifts in people's thoughts about home buying. Many of the surveys still indicate people are still committed to the American dream and they do want to own a home, et cetera, but they don't seem to be acting on that over the last four years. So we characterize that as very little uh, diminishment in, uh, in enthusiasm, but definitely erosion in confidence. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And ability, as you pointed out, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Prentice. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Prentice. Go ahead, Jane. Oh, I was just going to cite a, a, a recent survey, and it's by the MacArthur Foundation, uh, which I think it just came out uh, late last week. But in their survey, they found that 61% of the respondents believe the housing crisis still continues, and that 41% uh, of the respondents believe that the worst is still to come as related really to housing. Make your point. <laughs> Observation and a question for any of you on the ground in this. Uh, the first is seven million people lost their homes, and I'm being maudlin, but we didn't do anything for those people. It, it remains to me. I will go to my grave telling people who don't want to hear this. We saved the system. We stabilized mm -hmm. the economy. And we let seven million people go, and they didn't need to go and it would have stabilized our markets. It was a terrible decision, and it's wrong. Okay, that said, I'll ask my question. Uh, there are three to four million people in danger of foreclosure on your graph, and I'd be curious, the one thing the CFPB has done is drastically improve the procedures for mortgage servicing for people who are in foreclosure. Uh, and I'd be curious, your reflections of how, if that's changed, how it's changed uh, for how, this is Julie, I guess, or, or uh, I guess how that's so. changed for, uh, because of the changes in the CFPB rules. So we've seen improvements in relationships with lenders. Uh, we've also, we have instances of folks who aren't following the rules. So it's, it has gotten much better. I would say our demand for foreclosure prevention services in Minnesota is below pre-crisis levels. So we, we're kind of experiencing a new normal, and I think part of that is attributable to the fact that there are mechanisms in place now through the CFPB, and lenders have some of their own internal stuff that goes on, but not everybody's playing by the rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would agree. Uh, the Homeownership Preservation Foundation was invited to set up the system back in 2007 uh, from Secretary uh, Paulson. Uh, and it was primarily out of a sense of a need for having a resource, an independent resource where consumers could call in because they weren't getting much in the way of responses from 
from the lenders. Uh, in 2005, I think we, we um, uh, responded to one and a half million phone calls. Um, this past year, it was more like 400,000. So clearly, the, the, uh, the, the housing crisis is abating in terms of its intensity. Uh, and we have seen improvements um, you know, in servicer responsiveness to consumers, but there's still problems. Uh, I think it was evidenced in the OCC announcement that yesterday. I mean, there's still, uh, I give them, you know, B for effort, uh, and, but the execution is still, still falls short of what the con consumers really need. Thank you. Jean, Julie, thank you. And I'll ask our tech support to um, change presentations as we shift gears. Um, thank you um, for that information and, this, and that discussion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Ann Bedore is going to uh, share with us what she's seeing uh, in, in her work on trends and themes with regard to auto title and payday lending. So, Ann, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. And um, my name is Ann Bedour, and I'm with Texas Appleseed from Austin, Texas. And I thought that talking about the Texas market, though we're here in Nebraska and it's a very far away and a very different place, but it still might be interesting in the scope as we are looking at small dollar lending and what kind of, what is the right approach? What are the problems in this market? And what's the right approach? And what makes Texas interesting is that in the payday and auto title lending space, we have very um, open regulatory structure. We don't have limits on the size of the loans. We don't have limits at the state level on rollovers. We don't have um, limits on the fees that can be charged in conjunction with these loans. And so really, it's a very open and free market from that perspective. And also, we see all of the different products that are outlined in the small dollar lending guidance in Texas. And so I think it makes it an interesting market to look at. So I'm sorry, how's this? I wanted to start by just giving you a picture of the market because none of these products exist in a vacuum. And small dollar lending in Texas, just like in many other states, we have regulated <coughs> loan statutes designed for consumer loans. Um, and then the payday and auto title loans have, have operated outside of those, those structures for some years now. So just to give you an overview of the market in Texas, we have a regulated loan category that's, that I'm calling lower rate. There's a statutory citation for it. But um, it's a 30% rate cap. There's a maximum $100 origination fee that can be charged one time per year. It permits credit insurance, collateral insurance, as well as car clubs. And the maximum, there, it's a staggered rate. So as the amount of the loan goes up, the rate goes down. But the maximum loan amount is about $17,000. And they have to assess the ability to repay. It's a, it's, a, it's a rule, a regulatory requirement. The average loan in this market is $7,800. But we see a lot of loans in the two, $3,000 range. And, and there is some overlap between this and some of the larger auto title loans that we see in the auto title lending space. So I thought it would be relevant to pre prevent, present that as one of the schemes. The other scheme that actually parallels very closely to the payday lending market is our higher rate regulated loan. It's a maximum of 14% per month is essentially what the charges add up to. There are no, no credit insurance or other um, additional products are permitted. A $1,400 is the maximum loan size, and they also have to assess the borrower's ability to repay. And we see that this market tends to be around 80 to 100 percent APR, six month, 500, 651 is the average. So very similar, not necessarily in duration, but to the single payment payday product. And then we have the payday and auto title loans. And in Texas, these businesses operate in a unique way. I think Ohio is the only other state that has the same model of operation in any, um, s sort of any scaled way. They, it's a three-party system, so you have the consumer, you have the what we would think of as the payday loan store, but actually per, per, is, operates as a broker, and then you have the lender. And so the lender lends at 10% interest, and then the payday storefront or online portal where the customer goes, 
they charge a fee to arrange the loan, to guarantee the loan, to service the loan, and then they also engage in collections and then may sell it to a debt collector at some point in the process. So, um, and so that there's a 10% interest rate but unlimited fees associated with these loans. And what we see in the Texas market is $500 to $1,000, depending on the loan type, and two-week to six-month loan terms. 180 days, more or less, is the maximum loan term. There's some gray in the law, but that's generally the standard in the market. So just to illustrate what I described to show how this credit services, or it's called the credit services organization model, and in 2011 there was a statutory change that pulled out a category called a credit access business, which was essentially payday and auto title businesses using the credit services organization statute to operate. So you can see how the consumer pays money to the credit services organization, which is in the middle, and they don't connect to the lender. The lender has an arrangement with the, with the um, storefront, and they collect interest. They can also collect um, late fees and some NSF charges. So. Um, it's how the model functions in, in Texas. I also want to just tell you about a, another issue that's important and a piece of this dynamic is that there's been a big push for reform in this market space really for the last probably five years because of the very high costs and a lot of community-based organizations have experienced problems with clients getting caught up in this debt and many organizations have ended up having to use their charitable funds to give money to their clients to get them out of this kind of debt. And it's been a very difficult fight at the state level to have reform in this marketplace. There have definitely been some important steps forward and some important efforts to negotiate some kind of a solution. But, but there wasn't a successful out outcome. And so the cities in Texas have um, gone at this themselves. And so we have a movement in Texas around city ordinances, passing some basic regulations around payday and auto title lending. To date, 24 cities, including a lot of the largest cities in Texas, have passed these ordinances. And they just do basic structural things to the loans. The cities can't cap the rates. So they limit the loan size based on income. They limit the duration of the transaction to four total payments and um, require that every payment pay down a quarter of the principal so that after four payments, the borrower would be out of debt. So that's what the city ordinances have done. The first ordinance passed in the city of Dallas in June of 20, 2011 went into effect in January of 2012. As you can imagine, there's been litigation around these ordinances, and it took a few years for that to sort out. But there are now some strong state appeals court decisions in support of the cities. And so I, I, my expectation is that the cities will continue to move forward and probably will see more enforcement. So those ordinances have been enforced and upheld in Texas? In Ohio, when cities did this, it all got knocked down by the Supreme Court as preempted by state law. Yeah, these have so far been upheld. The latest, so there's one appeals court um, in Dallas that um, ruled in favor of the city of Dallas. And then there was just most recently a second appeals court in Fort Worth against the city. It was a suit related to the city of Denton, and the city of Denton won at the appeals court level. I don't think the, date, the deadline has passed for appeal to the state of the Supreme Court yet. So. I don't know what will happen. And the legislature hasn't tried to intervene? And, and the legislature has not intervened. That's interesting. Okay. So it's kind of been, been the status quo. We've had two legislative sessions since the ordinances first came into effect. And so um, really, and I'm, so what I'm going to be talking for most of the presentation is about state level data, data that payday and auto title businesses have to report to the Texas state regulator just to see how the market is performing and to see how these four different products in the Texas market interact. And, and what I've seen is I think it's too soon to really see how these city ordinances are directly impacting that state data. A lot of it was tied up in litigation for some years, and so there hasn't been significant or, or, or organized enforcement of the city ordinances. So I think with more time and hopefully if we can get city level data, we can understand in a deeper way how these are impacting the market. But what we can see and what we have seen is um, a decrease in the number of storefronts. And, and so we've seen overall from 2012 to 20, the beginning of 2015, there's been a 20% decrease in locations in cities with ordinances. 
Um, but to put that into context, those same areas experienced a 130 percent increase in storefronts over the decade, or um, 11 years from 2004 to, to 20, 2015. And so though there has been a contraction in the market, there still remains a robust presence of these businesses. So comparing, I wanted to start just by comparing these different categories of of loans. So the light blue bar is 2012, the dark blue bar is 2013. We only had two years of overlapping data, so it's what I was able to, prov to provide. So you see the, the um, lower rate regulated lenders um, are about um, just, just under $2 billion in the marketplace in 2014, and you can see a lot of growth in that market sector in Texas. The higher rate have a sm smaller level of growth, but still growth, and they're about a $3 billion um, loan, loan segment. And then the payday and auto title segment altogether is about $4.26 billion, and we are seeing a decrease in that market space, though some of that, really a lot of that decrease can be attributed to a shift in product balance, which we'll, we'll get to. Um, and then you also see here a graph of the locations and the number of store locations. And you can see that there's been some growth in the regulated lending space at the same time that we've seen a, a decline in the number of storefronts in the payday and auto title space. And are those originations or outstandings? Um, or originations? Th those are, um, I, I think it's it's just what the re, the regulator reports on their data sheet. I, don't, I think it's just the total dollar amount of loans that were made originated during that year, but it includes new loans and refinances. So it's the whole body of of loans that were made during that year. So this 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 chart looks at um, trends for the whole volume of payday and auto title loans, it includes new loans, refinances, and fees in the marketplace. And so the red are single payment payday loans, the orange installment payday loans, the gray are single payment auto title loans, and the dark blue is um, installment auto title loans. And you can see that installment auto title loans consistently are a relatively small piece of the market. But what's interesting to me in, in looking at this is that we're, as we're seeing the single payment payday loans declining, we're seeing other segments of the market increase. And, and specifically, it's the installment um, payday loan part of the market that's decreased. So we've seen a 3% total volume, you know, decrease in the volume, and a 12% decrease in the new loans, but a 15% increase in fees. And a lot of that is attributed to this shift toward the installment payday loan, because one installment payday loan is $500, but collects as many fees or has as many fees attached to it as five or six or 10, just depending on the structure, single payment loans. And so you can see how you see that shift. It's, what's interesting to me is that the auto title, single payment auto title, has also been a, a growing segment in the marketplace. Um, and again, the fee increase that we're, that we're seeing in the market has largely been driven by installment payday lending. So then this takes those two segments, and I, I didn't divide them out by product because really the single payment and the installment tend to have similar patterns associated with them. So this looks at new loans, which is the orange category, refinances, which is the gray category, and fees, which is the blue. So you can see in the single payment um, sector that refinances make up around half of all the new loan volume in that marketplace across really all of the three years. And that the dollar value of refinances, it's about a 1.5 to 2 to 1 ratio. So for every dollar of new loans, you see a dollar fifty to two dollars of refinances in, in the marketplace. And, and, and one interesting note, and it's especially in the 2014 data, and I don't know what the reason is, but a lot of the increase in refinances has been driven by the single payment auto title lending sector. So then going to the installment loans, you see a little bit of a different picture. Again, the orange is the new loans, the gray is the refinances, and the blue is the fees. And in the case of the installment loans, it's the fees that are making up the bulk of the market. So almost half of the total market volume is fees. And again, it's installment payday lending that's really driving that. And 
what, what we see and, and, and what explains this is that when you have the longer term loans, it essentially means fewer refinances but higher fees because the cost of the loans over time is, this, is almost the same. So going into these specific products, I know there are a lot of numbers here, so I'll try to pull it out, but I thought it would be helpful to look at all these different indicators about the market. So if you look at the single payment payday space in Texas, it tends to be very short-term loans averaging nine, 19 days, and, and the average loan amount is around the $500 figure. We have higher than typical fees in Texas, so we, we often hear the $15 on 100 fee cited, and in Texas, the fees tend to be closer to $23 on 100. Um, the, the data looks at refinancing by bar, at the borrower level, at the quarterly level, and so what it looks at is within the quarter, for loans that are taken out within that quarter, new loans within that quarter, we see that more than half of the bor borrowers who are originating a loan within the quarter are refinancing the loan. Um, we also see that refinances make up about 60% of all the loan transactions in any year. And, and then the, we, don't, we don't have annual data on how many times a borrower refinances transactions within a year that's tied to the borrower, but as an average, the average transaction, so if you take all the new loans and refinances and divide that by the number of borrowers, you get f around between four and six loan transactions per year. And so the cost of that is between $1,000 and $1,100 to access $500 of credit, just as an idea. Then the other part of the data that we do have, so at the annual level, instead of looking at borrowers and borrowers refinancing, it looks at transactions that have been paid in full during that one year period. And so then this is the whole volume of all the transactions, including all the loans in the sequence until the loan is repaid. And so it looks at the proportion of that whole body of loans in the sequences that leads to a repayment with no refinance, one refinance, two to four, and then the five or more. It actually parses it out even a little more than that, but I just for simplicity's sake. And the five or more category is likely underestimated because the, the highest category we have is more than 10 refinances. And so it's hard to know how many refinances that category represents. And so I use the most conservative estimate of 11 um, to, to come up with that number. And so we see that um, fewer than one in five are repaid with no refinance, around, I guess, 14, 15%. 40% of the loan transactions are generated by borrowers refinancing five or more times before repaying the loan. So then when we look in the single payment auto title loan, you know, we see one month average loan terms, which is I think a very typical um, thing that we see compared to other states that have these single payment loans and $1,000 to $1,200. Um, 40 to 47 percent of the borrowers refinance every quarter, so that means that they're taking out the loan and refinancing it within that exact same quarter. Um, and what's interesting is that in the auto title space, it seems like for those borrowers who refinance, they're in debt to that auto title loan for the vast majority of that quarter, you know, between two and three months out of that quarter. Um, there seems, you know, the data shows a significant uptick in refinances in 2014, and again, I don't have an explanation for that, but we see almost 70 percent of all the loan transactions in, in 2014 are refinances, which is, uh, sh you know, demonstrates a, an increasing rate over the period of the data that we have. And then on average, averaging all the loans and all the borrowers, you see three to four loans in one year is the average of the whole market, and that would be between $1,700 and $1,800 to access $1,000 of credit. Um, and then for, re for the repossessions, we see about one in six borrowers in 2014 lost a car to repossession. So that's on top of any refinances or other, um, other transactions. You know, we don't know at what point in the process that happened. Those are just the, the general statistics. And so then when we look at loan sequences, um, it's definitely uh, the 2014 is, stands out. In 2013, it was about one in five loans that were refinanced, refinances. And in 2014, for those loans that were paid back, one in 10, only one in 10 were paid back with no refinance at all. Um, between 30 and 67 percent of the loan transactions were borrowers who were refinancing five or more times before paying off the loan. Um, 
So then moving into the installment auto title, um, one of the things that's interesting to me, because a lot of times we, I've heard conversations, is the installment borrower the same as the single payment borrower? Are these serving the same segments? And at least what we see in Texas is based on the numbers, it appears yes. You know, the loan amounts are very similar. Um, the loan sizes are, are and, and we see similar APRs, so that it's not that having the installment leads to any change in the cost structure, it just creates a longer period of time. And, and it's an important thing that in Texas, just because it's an installment loan, it doesn't mean that it's amortizing. So we have balloon installment loans as well. There's no requirement around how the installment structure looks. Um, if you look at the quarterly refinancing rate, um, there definitely seems to be a decrease in the percentages of borrowers refinancing in any one quarter, and it tends to parallel the increasing loan term, which is not a surprise as the loan terms get longer, then you know, the refinancings, may, to the extent that they happen, will happen at less frequent intervals. Um, but, but one thing that stuck out at me in this data is that the longer term doesn't seem to impact the number of refinances per quarter. So the borrowers who refinance do so one to two times per quarter. So it seems like there's this consistent percentage of borrowers who, upon entering the loan, are immediately in trouble. Because that's the only reason, that, that's the only thing that would, either they want more money immediately or they have a tr trouble making the payment, and that's what generates the, the refinance. And, so that for, a, for such a long-term loan to have so many refinances in a short period of time definitely stuck out. There are 30 to 35% of all the loan transactions. And on average, um, a borrower, so if you average all the loans, loans with all the borrowers, um, it's about eight and a half to 11 months of indebtedness and $2,500 to $2,600 to access $1,000 of credit over a year. Um, six to 12 percent of borrowers lose a car to repossession. We see a lower repossession um, rate in this segment of the market than we do in the single payment market. Then looking at loan sequences, um, six, so there's also seems to be, because the terms are much longer, lower number of refinances among those loans that were paid in full in the, in the, in the um, year, the data year. So 60 percent um, were generated by borrowers who refinanced at least once. So that means 40% repaid their loans with no refinances. Um, but what's interesting also is that despite the longer terms, um, one in five loans um, um, were paid off with five or more refinances in the calendar year. So we still see a significant amount of refinances in that space. Looking at the installment payday loans, again, we see a very similar loan size and cost to the single payment product. It's around the $500 mark um, with similar, similar APRs. Um, again, there's a decreasing quarterly refinance rate as the loan terms have increased from 98 days to 152 from 2012 to 2014. Um, but again, we see the same trend that the longer um, term doesn't seem to dramatically impact the number of refinances in, among those borrowers who have to refinance. They seem to refinance the same number of times. So there is a core percentage of the borrowers who are either needing more money immediately or getting in trouble immediately and having to refinance the loan, loan transaction. There, over time, between 15 and 30 percent, when the loan terms were shorter, refinances made up a larger percentage. As they've gotten longer, they've made up a smaller percentage of the, of the loan transactions in that one year period. Um, the average borrower is indebted seven to eight and a half months and pays between sixteen and nineteen hundred dollars to find access five hundred dollars of credit over one year in this segment of the market. Then when we look at the loan sequences, we see again about 40 percent were generated by borrowers. So we see a higher level of no refinance, loans being paid back with no refinances in this sector, 60 percent. 40 percent were generated by a borrower who refinanced at least once, and about one in ten paid off in each calendar year included five or more refinances. So I wanted to go into a little more detail about the installment payday loan because it's really the growth sector that I see in the Texas market and in the, in the data that we're just seeing a lot more of these products. And I wanted to show you, th th these are numbers from an actual loan contract 
and, and to, for you to see how the repayment works. And this is an example of a fully amortizing 168, so it's 12 biweekly payments, 581% APR. And what stands out to me is after six payments, which is halfway through the loan process, the borrower has paid more than the um, total amount borrowed. It's a 1400, 1455, and the borrower has paid 1779 in, in fees and still owes 69% of the principal. And, and what, what I've seen happen with these kinds of loans that's problematic in my mind is that there, it happens when borrowers oftentimes after they've made it some part through the loan will need to refinance because of a hardship or whatever reason. And what will often happen is that the fees that are rolled into the loan as a result of the refinance will essentially kick it back up to the original loan principal and then the whole process starts again. So if this person successfully repays this loan in 138 days, they would pay $4,286 to borrow $1,455. But then if they have to refinance, you can see how that cost can start compounding fairly quickly. Then the second very common loan structure that we see is the installment, balloon installment payday loan structure. And this is an example, this was actually an example from an individual on a fixed income on Social Security. And so they were receiving monthly payments. Um, and, and the way this is structured, it's essentially equivalent to a single payment loan that's rolled over five times. Because the borrower pays that $108 um, fee and then another $108 fee, and you can see five times in the sixth payment includes the principal, the 10% simple interest, and the, um, and the final fee amount. And, and so what will happen for, for people who experience hardship with these loans is they'll be able to make those periodic fee payments when it comes to the balloon. Um, they may not be able to um, make that full payment, and so they'll refinance the whole cycle so that one refinance for an installment payday loan is really the equivalent of 10 or 11 refinances of a single payment loan. So this is kind of a picture of the market that we have in Texas and what the state data we're seeing. And I, I want to talk a little just quickly about the data. The data is self-reported data by the businesses that operate in the payday and auto title lending credit services organization space in Texas. And it's reported by store location. And so it doesn't capture, like if I'm a borrower and I borrow at five different stores, I'm five different people. Or if I take out an auto title loan at one store and I <coughs> refinance it by going to another store to pay it off, I'm two people with two different loans and one has been successfully repaid. So, but at, at the same time, I think it does still, it still gives us a, a, an interesting picture of the market. And so what are my reflections in looking at the proposal that we talked about this morning? You know, the first thing that strikes me is in the single payment space, whether you look at the um, ability to repay option or the alternative option, it seems to capture the middle of the market. Like the alternative um, option, it's three <coughs> loans in a row and then a break and three loans in a row. And we're seeing like three to six loans in a year appears to be very typical of the very, you know, the average of the market. And so I think it's, it's interesting that the rule seems to capture that average of the market. And so, I mean, I see that as a positive, that it's, that the restrictions are really targeting those people who are getting in trouble with the loan. The other thing, and I guess my first point that I skipped over, is that I think the broad scope of the proposal is essential. When we saw those first tables, you saw the different pieces of the market and how as one got smaller, another piece got bigger. I think all those four pieces of the market interact together, and to just address one piece of that market would just simply push the volume to other pieces, and so I think that's another part of the proposal that is, is very, very helpful, and at least in the Texas context, very meaningful. Um, in the, in the installment side, I think that the ability to repay standard would definitely be an improvement on the market that we're seeing in Texas. And, and just to put it into context, there was a big negotiation process in 20, um, 2013 to try to come up with some kind of regulatory scheme that everybody could agree on for this market space. 
And what came out in an agreed to version of the bill was payments on the installment loan that equaled 30% of the borrower's gross monthly income. And so it's, I, in my perspective, I don't think that's affordable for many people. I know that the rule is contemplating 5%, and there's also been some pushback on, on that. But what we see is that's probably reflective of that, what we see in that market today. And, and so having an affordability standard, I think, would be very meaningful. But one of the concerns I have is we've been seeing those products getting longer and longer and longer in term, and I'd be you know, wouldn't want to see this market space pushing those terms even longer in order to have an affordable payment, individual payment, but maybe people can never get to that point where they can actually pay off the loan. They'll hit a bump in a road or something, they'll refinance, and then they start all over again. Um, the fourth point I wanted to talk about was those installment balloon loans. And so the way the proposal it treats those right now, there is an ability to repay assessment at the front end, which I think is very important. But it does allow three back-to-back -back balloon installment loans before the presumption of inability to repay kicks in. And if you look at that loan that we, um, sh that we showed the payments on, that's essentially 18 back-to-back single-payment loan transactions, which is very different from what you're seeing in the ability to repay standard on the single-payment loan. And so I think that that's another segment to that, um, at least based on our Texas experience, would maybe merit some additional look. So those are my reflections and interested in other people's thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's obviously very relevant to the conversations we've been having um, today and over the past couple of days. Uh, we've got a little time for uh, questions or reflections on Ann's presentation, so open it up for the cab. How's this aligned with uh, your experience and what are your I, I just, responses? You know, I, I'm very familiar with these numbers, and so the one number that really surprised me was the pretty dramatic increase in repossessions, particularly for the single payment um, mm -hmm. auto title. Is what, what do you attribute the pretty dramatic increase? I mean, because we're talking about now 44,000 or so right. repossessions per year. And I mean, what's interesting is that it also parallels a huge jump in refinances. And so those two dynamics at least are correlated, if not yeah. connected. And I don't have a good answer for what is what is driving that. We're starting to now look at the MSA. We, so the data is provided at, at um, I think it's 16 MSAs as well as at the state level. Yeah. And, and so the MSAs where we're seeing increased um, refinances in that sector do not necessarily parallel MSAs with city ordinances or there doesn't, yeah. so, so I don't know what the driver and, and not that that would necessarily drive those, but trying to see, like, are there unique yeah. factors that, that differentiate? So I think it was instructive in the 2013 no negotiations. The auto title in industry was basically saying that they could not live without six refinances as a cap, right? right. That, was, that was what they could not live without was six refinances. So that seems to be kind of where, where they're going. That, right. So it's interesting. In... In my state, it's interesting that the, um, I'm glad to see that the um, local municipalities have made some progress on, uh, to some degree on reforms. The, um, um, it's been limited, I think, in Mississippi and in some cases. The, um, in many cases, I think the, the state and, and local municipalities are, are waiting to see what the uh, CFPB rules result in. Well, I mean, I think it ties to one of the comments that I think it was the last comment that was made in the public session about this being an economic development issue and an economic de issue for those communities. Because if you look at the cities in Texas that have passed these ordinances, and in the vast majority of cities they've passed unanimously, there have been a few dissenting votes and a few um, walkouts, <laughs> people who didn't show up for the vote. But overall, it's been unanimous support. And the biggest driver has been the impacts and the economic impacts on the on the community that's that's driven cities to take take this action and and much of it was was spurred by local 
local nonprofit organizations that we're seeing more and more of their clients getting caught up in these loans. But the other thing that I think is encouraging is in a lot of those cities where we've seen these ordinances go into effect, we've also seen a lot of energy in the community around creating alternatives and, and around developing other options. And it's by no means a perfect scenario. I think there's a long way to go. But having those two, it's been interesting to watch those two work in tandem and connect it together. Uh, thanks for an incredibly clear and interesting presentation, Anne. It, it also tells you how hard it is to write this rule because it's written against 50 states and every state data shows it's going to play out differently, right? Um, I, I have a question. When you look at this and based on your experience, does this tell you that alternatives to an ability to repay standard should definitely have some sort of requirement of amortization in order to prevent, in order to mimic an ability to pay, repay. Yeah. That's what I'm getting out of what you said, but maybe I'm, you know. Yeah. Does that make sense? I believe an amortization feature is an important safeguard because, again, it creates a realistic time frame. I, I love to quote the city council member who from Dallas who pushed the first. He said, you know, you get four kisses at the big and that's it. You know, the idea that you, can, you can't continue to charge fees on the same loan over and over and over again. And what the amortization does is it creates a realistic payment, and whether that payment's over six months or over four payments, whatever the, the maximum structure, it's a realistic payment that results in the loan being paid in full in, in, a, in a sequential manner. Four kisses at the pig. <laughs> <laughs> Pigs get fat and hot get slaughtered as well. I like that. Well, again, Ann, thank you. It's great information. And um, if there are no additional comments or questions, I will, uh, again, thank um, our guests in the audience and thank the city of Omaha for welcoming us. Thank you, Laura, for being such a great host. And I think this can... I think that concludes our meeting. Thank you all. Have a great day.